It's December, and it's just amazing to me, Phil, that another year has almost passed. Well, time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, that's true, and we have had fun on Artifacts this year. Well, we welcomed 67 people from the arts world to our studio in 1997. And at the end of the show, you'll see a list of each and every one of those talented guests. And if you stay with us for another 20 seconds, you'll find out about the talented guests who will join us for the December edition of Artifacts. It's a great lineup for the last show of the year. Stay tuned. Hello everyone, I'm Phil Lindsay from the Minneapolis Community Development Agency. And I'm Janet Zahn with the Office of Film, Video and Recording. Once again, we thought it would be interesting to do a show relating to the arts and spirituality, and it seemed to make sense to do it at this time of year. It also seemed timely, and at least in the context of the world of film and television, because we're currently seeing a resurgence of spirituality-based network television shows, including shows like Touched by an Angel and Nothing Sacred. Well, don't forget Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and of course, for centuries, artists have been performing and creating art within a given spiritual or religious context, including in this century and at this time, Brad and Cindy Garner, the co-directors of a dance company called Anointed Souls. Now that's Souls spelled S-O-L-E-S. -E They'll be my first guests. Then Angie Mullen joins Phil to talk about Agora, a gathering of religious art, which includes a new marketplace for artists, an, exhi an exhibit space, a workshop center, and a rental library for banners and religious art at the Andrew Riverside Presbyterian Church. Then we'll hear all about a wonderful holiday tradition, the Nativity. It's a living pageant of Christmas held annually at Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church. Now the chairperson of that event, Bob Van Zant, will bring us the word on this year's performance. And finally, you'll find out about a movie company that's been in the business of making films with a spiritual message since the 1950s. Worldwide Pictures' Barry Werner will be here to tell us about the Minneapolis-based film ministry of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, and he'll have some clips from their latest feature, The Ride. And that's not all. Of course not. The show just wouldn't be complete without the artifacts giveaway. Well, this month, a great gift idea for friends and family or for yourself. The new 16-month appointment calendar from the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, celebrating the extraordinary quality and rich history of our world-renowned park system and those who enjoyed it for well over a century, the people of Minneapolis. We'll be giving away a calendar, which would cost you $10 to buy, to the 6th and 9th caller to the City Cable 34 hotline at 673-2234. Leave your name, address, and phone number on the answering machine. Be sure to speak clearly and tell us you're watching Artifacts, too. And if you're the sixth or ninth caller to leave us a message, one of these beautiful calendars will be yours or yours to give as a gift. We'll be showing you some of the photos featured in the calendar as we take a short break before Phil welcomes his first guests, Brad and Cindy Gardner of Anointed Souls. We'll be right back. Well, if you're interested in purchasing one of those nice-looking park board calendars, they are available for $10. All proceeds go toward Park Board Youth Athletics. Just call 673-4828. Now, that number again is 673-4828. And now, my first guests on this edition of Artifacts are two people who, they're dancers, and I'm excited to have them on here and get to know them. Brad Garner. Hello. Thanks for being on the show. And Cindy Garner. Good to meet you. And just guessing by the names, you guys are related. Yes. That's right. Husband and wife, is that yes. right? Yes. Man and woman, husband, wife, mm -hmm. and co-directors of a dance company called Anointed Souls. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to just give some background on Anointed Souls, um, what it is you do, and a little bit of the sure. history, maybe? Okay. Um, it's something that I had a vision for for about four years. Um, I'm a Christian, and I dance, and the two worlds don't really collide naturally. So um, I thought it would just be important to dance about what I care about and just sort of, like, you know, people... People make their art about what's important to them, and so that's what I'm trying to do. Um, it's interesting because my grandmother um, asked me, "Well, how are you going to do this without, you know, storytelling or speaking?" Because you know, you'd assume that the gospel would have to play in real strong, and and I guess I don't have an answer for that. But dance is abstract, and um, that's just kind of 
our faith is kind of where it starts and goes from there. So. Well, actually, I think, Cindy, on the phone a few days back, you were describing uh, there is an abstractness to what you do. Mm -hmm. um, so really, I suppose the, the spirituality, the, the religious part of what you're right. talking about informs that? Is it your, is, it's the motivator for what Definitely. you're Definitely. Then how does yeah. that work as a choreographer? What, how do you do that? How do you get that idea mm -hmm. out into the feet and the body and the movement? Um, well, you, you start with themes, usually. Sometimes it might be a song. Um, sometimes it may be uh, a scripture from the Bible. Other times it might be a poem or a story or just a real-life experience that you've had. Um, and you go into the studio and you use those themes to generate uh, movement. Uh, maybe, you know, like we said, we like to work really abstractly, so it may be that it's very clear to us and it might not be so clear to the viewer, but I think it's always evident that there's... Uh, a strong impetus for the work mm -hmm. and um, a lot of times too the title can give the viewer a little more information or the costumes that you choose so and sometimes you use text in the in the work so there's a lot of tools that you can use depending on how much you want to communicate and that's that's the fun part about this work is that um, like with Ten Souls, the dance we're going to see today, it's very abstract and there's you know different people have different stories for it um, different than mine but the, the new work that I'm working on now is to all Negro spirituals. And so that's, that's pretty explicit. So that's really clear. And, mm -hmm. and that's, uh, it's nice when you can sort of go, you know. Now, in that case, the, the spirituals will, will drive it not only in terms of what they're saying, but also the form, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, the formal part of mm -hmm. that spiritual singing, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that make it look a lot different than the other things you've done? Yeah. I, I think the music that you choose definitely uh, changes the But if you took away the lyrics and just saw the dance, you wouldn't necessarily go, oh wow, this is about, you know, praying, or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. um, it, it's more open for people of all types of audiences. It's yeah. not. Well, that, actually, that's a very good point you're making there, because I bet a lot of folks are watching and say, oh, well, that must be something they do in churches and only in churches, mm -hmm. but is that true? Well, mm -hmm. we perform in churches, but our training is in the world, and um, I dance for a couple companies in the Twin Cities, and Cindy's graduating from the U right now, and we're not, like that's it's really the center of our lives, but it's not the center of um, what we don't expect it to be the center of everybody else's lives. Mm -hmm. You know, we're very um, just this is really where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a teacher ask one of the Anointed Souls dancers, um, "Well, it's really great that you're doing this, but why don't you just make art?" And I just her comeback for that was, "Well, we do make art. You make art about what is important to you, and we make it about what's important to us." And so that's really the. Um, it's really meant to be broad and um, something that you can enjoy as dance if you just enjoy dance or you can enjoy if you're in a church or outside of a church mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying it's not meant to exclude anybody mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well actually my encounter with your group was actually indirect mm -hmm. uh, my partner had seen you folks at a benefit for the Minnesota Dance Alliance mm -hmm. which is certainly I assume anyhow a secular kind yes. of place yeah. so you do go out in, in secular sure. venues and, sure. right. and perform yeah and, and a, um, a real uh, goal of Anointed Souls is to expose people who wouldn't normally go into a church, would never set foot into a church, right. but to be able to expose them to work of this nature mm -hmm. and in a way that isn't um, necessarily uh, insulting or bombarding, but just this is, this is you know, what we're doing dance about. And, and I think that dance in the church right now has um, a reputation of being uh, a bit mediocre. And that's another goal of Anointed Souls is to help yeah. to participate in raising the standard of dance. Mm -hmm. We're all, um, we all have or are in pursuit of uh, degrees of dance. All of our dancers are. So there's a lot of education behind what we do, right. um, either Bachelor of Fine Arts or Bachelor of Arts degrees. And these people, um, they're, they're educated in composition of dance, in um, anatomy and kinesiology, in dance technique, in the teaching of dance. So. We want, uh, and, and usually when you go into churches, um, the case is that these people love to dance, but they don't have a lot of training. Mm -hmm. And so they just sort of, they just do it because they love it. And there's, there's not a whole lot of groups that uh, have excellent training. Because, you know, if you're, if you're very talented and you're, you have this, this uh, great history of dance education, you want to go off and be in this huge company. Right. You know, and that's something that Brad and I uh, still consider, but... Uh, ultimately, we want to have this environment where um, people who have God as a focus in their lives can also keep dance as a focus, you know, okay. and they don't have to feel like they're, um, they're compromising anything, okay. uh, you know, that they're sort of doing easy stuff because it's in the church, but it's still very 
um, technical, very advanced, but they can you know, still Push the envelope it. a little bit. Yeah. Kind of technical. Yeah. Well, you were nice enough to provide us with uh, a tape of uh, a recent mm -hmm. uh, piece that you did. And in just a second, why don't we take a look at that? Um, and the name of the, the dance piece is? Ten Souls Arising. Ten Souls Arising. Mm -hmm. And why don't we take a look at that now, and we'll come back and we'll do a little chat okay. about that. Okay. okay. Well, that was a nice looking piece. That Thank was good. You. Now, who dances with you? Who do you line up to um, be on stage? Well, most of our dancers right now are from the university. They're students from the U, but we also have um, a few graduates from the university and then graduates from other programs, too. Um, our dancers total about nine right now. Right. Mm -hmm. And as Cindy said earlier, we're, we're really interested in having like well-rounded dancers, mm -hmm. people who could dance for their lifetime. They choreograph, they teach, mm -hmm. they dance and perform. They um, are interested in maybe administrative things like mm -hmm. grant writing and stuff like that. Oh, that's useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not just I'm a body here to dance. Yeah. Well, now, given that, though, is it difficult to find people who, who have those skills and that background, that professional desire to move on? It really is. And, and who have um, a particular religious uh, drive well, to communicate. Is you'd that actually a hard? be surprised. It's, yeah. it's like they just kind of come out of the woodwork. They really and do. And they hear about us and they approach us. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, I mean, we're not like putting up you know, audition notices and things like that mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. It's 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 much yeah. more about like this community wanting to do something, you know, without tambourines and banners maybe. Mm -hmm. You know what right. I mean? Right, I know. Yeah. 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 Well we have just a minute left unfortunately. But I think earlier, Brad, you said something about the fact that uh, dance in the church isn't and you both refer to the fact that it isn't maybe that common, that prevalent, that well respected. Right. Mm -hmm. Is cause I think of the choral tradition certainly oh, is yeah. very yeah. strong. Mm -hmm. But are the perform the other performing arts just is this sort of a new well, wave that you guys are you know, pushing theater in? theater has been growing as well, mm -hmm. and music is at is such a high level in yeah. the church. It's like, I don't know, I just, I personally feel that, you know, church should be creative. You know, I just think that's, a lot of the most famous work in the world is from the church, like Bach, Bach. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I don't see any reason why the church can't be a source of um, mm -hmm. putting good art out, you know? I like to remind people that Bach really was uh, sort of an ethnic, liturgically based right. musician, mm -hmm. is, is really mm -hmm. what we think of him as sort of this right. um, non-denominational, exactly. classical musician. And this music was Bach, Bach. as well. Mm -hmm. Indeed, mm -hmm. indeed. Well, I want to thank you both for being here. Thank You've got you. a show coming up. Yes, we do. Um, this, uh, the upcoming weekend of December, December 5th, 6th, and 7th. It's called Emerging Seven. It's not specifically Anointed Souls, but it features uh, three choreographers from Anointed Souls and most of our dancers. So um, it's at Hen Prince Center for the Arts. Okay, uh, and there's Theater a phone 6A. number in 6A. Mm -hmm. and there's a phone number if people want to get in touch with your group. Mm -hmm. And that number is? 374-3106. One more time. 374-3106. I want to thank you both. Cindy, thank nice you. to have you on the show. Thank Brad, you. good to have you here. You too. Very much. Now, artist Angie Mullen will be joining me right after this short break featuring a beautifully handcrafted art wreath created by Sherry Nolan. Take a peek, it's pretty neat.
Well, now, in case you've just tuned in, you're watching Artifacts, the show that brings the arts in Minneapolis home to you. And if you want to know more about The Wreath by Sherry Nolan that we just featured in the last break, or anything else that we cover on today's show, just call the City Cable 34 hotline. That's 673-2234. Now, my, my next guest, I'm really excited to talk with her. Um, she's an artist, and she was kind of discovered in an interesting way. Angie Mullen, Hi. thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Bill. Um, I had heard about uh, an organization that's starting up uh, in Minneapolis called Agora. <laughs> so I called a number, and I found a little bit about it. And it was recommended that I invite you on as a guest. And I said, OK, what does she do? And you are an artist. Yep. You specialize in pencil work. Mm -hmm. And in a minute, we're going to look at some of your pieces. But tell me a little bit about your work. How did you get started? And what do you like to put into your drawings? Well, um, I work with pencil, and um, I feel that God gave me this gift. It's a very special gift. Um, I had no training. It's all self-taught. I've spent hours and hours working on particular drawings, up to 20 hours per drawing. Um, wow. Uh, I like, I'm real, really in detail, um, realistic um, artwork. I like to uh, do shading techniques. Um, that's mainly the, you know, my artwork is, is mainly shading. Well, now, Angie, you said that God gave you that. I mean, at what point did you decide, I can draw? Um, when I was really little, I started drawing the Smurfs. And ever since then, I just kept drawing and so drawing So it all started with the Smurfs? When I was really little, yeah. yes. Isn't that funny? And um, up until, you know, I grew up in the church, and I had been drawing my whole life. And when I decided, you know, I wanted to do something with that, I wanted to focus on God. And, and to thank him for the gift he's given to me. Hmm. And so I focus mainly on, uh, you know, Christian themes and just to give the glory back to him. Well, now, those themes, which particular themes, how do they come to you? I mean, are you uh, reading or are you meditating or are you praying? Or what, what brings a given theme to your mind? Mm, like when you read through the Bible, a verse jumps out at you, and I think that, uh, hey, that would be some something to draw, you know, something cool if I could put it in pencil and, yeah. and actually put put the work behind the idea, mm -hmm. you know. So just things come to mind and it's like, you know, I sit there and doodle a little bit and see what I can come up with and something comes to me and it's like, yeah, you know, I'm going to focus on this. And, and Not 20 hours Oh, yes. Sometimes. Oh, many times. I yeah. have plenty of drawings that I've spent. Wow. That's got to have a lot of patience. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Ever get frustrated? You ever say, oh, this isn't going where I want? I mean, are there some projects that just stop? Um, this, this isn't working? Well, um, not necessarily. Um, I, I work very hard on my drawings, and um, I'm sort of a perfectionist in them. So, you know, I, I, I continue with it until I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied, until I'm very happy with it, and mm -hmm. then I let people see it. Well, certainly for thousands of years, the church has had a lot of art. I mean, certainly the visual arts have been well represented in everything from chapels and this. But today, here in the Twin Cities, I mean, are there other folks like yourself that are telling what they feel, what they believe through a visual medium like this? Are you running into other young artists, I guess? Um, <clears throat> well, I haven't really seen too many who are freelance like myself, who do work like myself. I really don't know of any other uh, artists who do pencil like I do. Okay. Um, that's sort of a unique thing, and I just don't run into too many people who do that. What is it about pencil that you like? Um, it gives me a way to express my my um, th the way I feel and and um, just to put it on paper and and just to to look at it and I'm amazed I I can't believe I can do it most of the time. Okay, it's well, amazing to me. Well, speaking of that, why don't we take a look now at a few pieces you brought in? Thank you, by the way. Sure. Um, why don't you just start with the first one there and. Mm -hmm. um, We'll get the camera on that and get, I, when I first saw these, I was amazed at the detail and the subtlety here of, I guess what I would call, since I don't do this, the shading and the, yeah. the texture. Talk a little bit about the technique that goes into this. Um, well, I just basically start with an outline mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's all, um, you know, I don't trace or anything, it's all freehand. Um, I start with the outline and then I just go in and shade little by little with you know, wow. the pencil and, and... So it's an additive thing. You add on uh, more, yeah, more I, of the image or more of right. the shading and all. Yep, you start with soft pen or actually harder pencil for the soft look. Then you go into a, you know, a darker pencil to bring out the detail in my work, you know. See, now I wouldn't have known that. So yeah, that's, and, okay, and I'm just, learning right here. Yeah. That's great. And what, what's the story or the theme behind this image right here? What, um, what uh, inspired this for you? This comes out of Matthew. 
and uh, it's where two or more gather in his name, there he is in the midst. Okay. And that's just a really neat way to, to have, you know, people supporting you. And, and mm -hmm. I just thought that was a good theme, mm -hmm. so I drew it. Solidarity and yeah. union there. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see, look at some more things. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This yeah, now again, here, there's some mind. fine work in here, obviously. And now I'm gonna, this is probably going to sound like I'm being silly here, but is one of the advantages working with a pencil is that if a line goes off, you can actually erase it. Right. You can get rid of a mistake, yes, right? Yes, yes. Because the detail mm -hmm. in here looks, I mean, it's very precise. Yes. What are you yes. going for here? This is, this is one yeah. of my favorite pieces. Yeah. For sure. Well, and there's a lot of different technique here. If you look down here, the rope in here, mm -hmm. um, very evocative there of the individual. Um, pieces of string or yes. that and then of course the hand the human figure there and then you get into um, yeah. the thorns and all that. I just sort of had an idea of Jesus on the cross and the cross symbolizing the nail in his in his palm mm -hmm. at the time. Now there's a little license I think you were saying I mean you've actually kind of moved uh, the nail there a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah you see pictures uh, all the time of artwork some in the palm some in the wrist. And mm -hmm. Oh okay so it's you know it's not illegitimate to have it in a different Mm, no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I just, whatever is given to me, I just draw it, you know? Okay. Yeah. Sure. Well, what else so, did you bring okay. here? Okay. Okay, this is... Now, I particularly like this dove here. Look at that. It, yeah. it feels as light as I think it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm, yeah. So now, how did, I mean, have you been drawing birds since you were a kid? I mean, it started with Smurfs, but how did you get into... <laughs> Um, the human figure, the um, uh, nature and stuff like that. I this. tend to go off of, uh, when I see a picture in a book or magazine or something, it gives me an idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, I sort of thought that, you know, out of the Old Testament, send forth your spirit, renew the face of the earth. That was sort of a really cool theme for this drawing. Okay. You know? Great. And so that's, that's what I drew here. See, I'm in awe because if somebody said, draw a bird, um, yeah. I... It, it wouldn't even be a cartoon. No, yeah. That, so. Nice going. This is good. <laughs> Thank you. And what else here? Yeah, I think okay. one more. Yeah, I have one more here. Yeah. Okay. Now this is a very bold, and it, whereas the last one we just saw was relatively light and right. almost literally uplifting. Yeah. This is much more sort of stolid and mm -hmm. um, anchored, almost grounded here. Were you going for that? Is that something you wanted to? Mm, this is just, uh, I feel Jesus reaching his hand out for all of us, mm -hmm. um, you know, come to the cross, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. and uh, his love and compassion is forever. Sure, and I suppose as an yeah. armchair critic here, I'm saying, you know, he's reaching earthward, yeah. heaven is up here. And mm -hmm. I mean, an interesting thing here too, the grain of the wood yes. matching sort of the musculature of, of the hand. That was conscious, right? Am mm -hmm. I getting something mm -hmm. that you wanted yeah. to to yeah. do that. Well, nice work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, well before you go, I want to talk briefly about Agora, which is a, um, a gallery, a store or something. What can you tell me about Agora? Where is it? And um, Agora is located one block west of 35W on the corner of 4th Street and 8th Avenue mm -hmm. near the U of M. Um, oh, yeah, kind of over near Dinky Town there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it opens Saturday, January 17th. Okay. And, um, and it's in, um, I'm forgetting which church. Andrew Riverside Presbyterian Church. Okay, so this is a part of, I guess, what, their ministry? It's part of what they see themselves doing there at yeah, that particular church. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very great opportunity for new and young artists like myself to, to have the opportunity to get in there and right. show my work and exhibit my work. When we were talking earlier, too, you're going to be one of about 50 artists represented, and it's, it's essentially non-denominational, from what yeah. I understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's Christian, Judaic, and other religious-oriented art as yeah. well. Is yeah, that right? that's right. Um, you, we have just a minute left, but you kind of discovered it in an interesting way yes, for this. Was. Can you briefly describe that? Sure. Well, I work at Kinko's Copy Center at Ridgedale in Minnetonka, and Judy McCockian comes in quite often to do work there. And, and after you see a customer so often, you just start talking. And uh, she uh, asked to see my portfolio, which I showed her, was happy to. And she loved my work, and she, she wanted to like sponsor me and put me in her gallery, which is a stepping stone for me. I'm really excited. That's great. And she's one of the people that's, what, starting up this Agora. Yeah, that's so right. So great. Yeah. Well, and just as we go here, there is a phone number over at Andrew Riverside Presbyterian Church yes. that people can call if they want information about Agora. Mm -hmm. And that number is? Uh, the telephone number is 331-1511. Okay, thanks. Well, Angie, you have very nice artwork. I want to thank you for coming in and thank sharing it so with much, us. Thank you so much, Phil. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you.
Now, up next, the December art quote, followed by my guest, Bob Van Zant. He'll be bringing us a taste of the nativity pageant that's running throughout the month of December at Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church. And in the meantime, don't forget to call 673-2234 to win one of two Minneapolis Park Board calendars that we're giving away this month. Leave your name, your address, and a phone number on the message machine, and if you're the sixth or ninth caller, you win. Stay tuned. Well, Willa Cather. My next guest is the chairperson of um, a pretty remarkable event that's staged annually at the Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church. Bob Van Zandt, I want to welcome you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for being appreciate here. Appreciate it. Uh, I had the pleasure of going to see this last year for the first time, and uh, well, I think we've used the term chills down the spine. I mean, it's quite a multidiscipline. I mean, there's music, there's there's choral, there's there's acting, there's dance. Would you just, in a nutshell, just describe what the nativity is? Uh, that you folks put on? We'd love to. The Nativity is really a memoriam to uh, Dr. Nelson and Marilyn Nelson's daughter who was killed her first year at college in an automobile accident. And most of us wouldn't have known that over the years Kurt, the founder of Carlson, used to gather the extended family and dress in bathrobes and reenact the birth of our Lord Jesus. After her death, uh, Marilyn, in reviewing and putting away personal artifacts, found that redundantly Juliet had constantly referred to how wonderful that was, what it meant to her personally, and even had a note that someday Grandpa will let me play Mary. Wow. And out of that, the, uh, 11 years ago, the original show was put together. Uh, Bob Johnny wrote it that did Radio City Music Hall for years. We've been putting it on for, this will be our 11th year, uh, and have become the largest contributor to the Holiday Bureau uh, of United Way uh, to, to also bring Christmas to those people who are less fortunate. Right. Uh, interestingly, uh, as you and I were chatting, now it takes about 150 people to put this on and it's just not a Hennepin function any longer. People come from every denomination throughout the Twin Cities. Right, and I think that's an important point, that it is not just the Methodists of that particular church they're involved, but they open their doors to everybody participating. My church is St. Leo's and St. Paul, mm -hmm. and I've been involved for seven of the 11 years, first as a participant, an actor, and then on the steering committee, and then got that call to uh, take the chairmanship yeah, the, the last guy. two years. Yeah. Right? Actually, you've played a couple of interesting roles, I, as I understand uh, it. Well, we all do what's asked of us, but uh -huh. uh, for years I played the prophet Zechariah, mm -hmm. which I thoroughly enjoyed. My early days I didn't do any speaking roles, but then the prophet Zechariah. But last year, due to who auditioned and where the needs were, I went from Prophet Zechariah to King Herod. <laughs> and that's about the opposite ends of the spectrum. I, I think though. they say that's a bit of a stretch over <laughs> to the other side there, yeah. This year, fortunately, uh, for half of the performances, I'm back to what I right. enjoy doing, and that's the Prophet Zechariah. Well, in looking at the program, too, the production of this is really quite amazing. I mean, there are dancers, uh, as I say, there's a wonderful opening fanfare, um, some horns up in the balcony there. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously the performers, the actors that are on uh, multiple stages. Um, but you're, a little claim to fame is also, this is the one with the live animals. That is correct. Uh, Bert, who is our donkey, who's owned by John Don Farms out uh, east of the Twin Cities, has been in every performance since the first one. And what a lot of people find interesting is Bert also is one of the stars of the Holodazzle. Yeah, he's got a good agent. because. <laughs> so Bert finishes the Holodazzle, which comes down the mall at 6.30, is loaded into a trailer, quickly rushed to the side entrance of the church, wiped down if it happens to be snowing, and on oh. stage within 10 minutes after that. Yeah. But having all of the live animals, we have doves, which sometimes choose to fly. Uh, we have exotic dogs, which we found existed in the time of the kings. Uh, we have sheep, lambs, goats, and Bert, and uh, they will react as animals will, Phil. So it well, is a live show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you do in a case? Not to be uh, well, we all feel about in. it. But uh, <laughs> I think it was four years ago. We had a flu epidemic, so many of us were changing costumes very rapidly because at the uh, at the finale, there's about 85 people on stage. Mm -hmm. So that there's a lot of folks that we need to have in costume. And they had asked me after the opening scene, which is where we form the huge cross with lanterns, if I would slip into a costume and help with the Bethlehem scene before I went up and introduced King Herod. 
and this was at the 4.30 performance on Sunday. So I slipped into the costume and went down, and John uh, said, as the animal trainer said, now you're going to take Naomi, and you cross the stage with the group, and then at this cue, come over, turn around, kneel down, and pull her close to you, and she'll relax. Oh. So I had done that, pulled her close to me, and I'm kneeling and staring at the, the crib and the, the introduction of the first time we've seen Jesus. And a young lad in the front uh, row said to his father, look, Dad, that sheep's peeing all over that man. <laughs> oh, my and word. As I, could, uh, I, I, you know, I had this warm running down my leg, but I thought it was just my muscles. Yeah. Uh, we did some very quick arrangements to be ready for the 7.30 show. So we hey, had Bob, those it's show business. That's right. That's right. That's right. And speaking of which, you were nice enough to provide us with the clip. Why don't we take a look at that right now, and then we'll come back and we'll Great. talk a little bit more about uh, the nativity, the living pageant. So here it comes. Uh, I think this is just a little excerpt of, uh, okay. of the pageant. very stirring in and of itself and congratulations on a nice production. Um, Bob, one of the things that people maybe don't know, although I think they should be aware of, is that not only is this um, a heartfelt expression, but any proceeds that you get go to charitable causes. Can you yes, tell us a little bit about that? We've been the largest contributor, Phil, to the United Way's Holiday Bureau since the show began. And those monies are given each year as uh, God has blessed us with an audience. Uh, last year, over 10,500 people came, mm -hmm. uh, so that it may be distributed to people that they select who otherwise may find Christmas a very straining experience for them because they are not able to have the food that they would like, able to maybe have the gifts and the sharing that they feel mm -hmm. are important to children. And so that's our mission is... Uh, to be successful and turn those monies over to them. Right. So it's literally part of the ministry here of all of you folks. That is correct. It is an outreach ministry that uh, has a purpose, and that's where we've chosen to place right. the monies. And then related to that, you started a new program last year, the Nativity Star. Yeah, two years ago, Couple actually. Years. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a brochure on it. But what we found is there were many people in need, be they single parents, uh, people who had terminal disease, people who had lost loved ones in the, in the last year, what have you that at Christmas time may be not as joyous a period as we would all hope as Christians. And Phil, this is certainly not to replace what we do in our own churches. As I mentioned, my church is in St. Paul. But it is something that gives uh, a, an additional way to gather people together and celebrate this time. 
And so I have buses that come from all over the Midwest bringing church groups. But through the Nativity Star, we also search out people who otherwise could not afford to come. Mm -hmm. The tickets range from uh, uh, $7 to $14, depending on whether it's a matinee or evening in the seating. And it takes that much, you know, to, to make this thing go. Uh, but these tickets are rewarded to those people so that they might, too, participate in wheelchairs mm -hmm. or what have you. And uh, again, as, as I've had so many people walk out and go, I remember Christmas. I, I want to share one quick story sure. on that that the star did. This is three years ago. A lady wrote us and said, I happened to end up in a marriage with a non-Christian, so my five-year-old never got exposed to Jesus. And it was an abusive relationship. And that relationship dissolved. And someone gave her tickets through us, through this program, to the, to the Live Nativity. And she brought her son. And after the show, she continued to say, or he continued to say, I want to know this Jesus. Hmm. I want to know more about Jesus. So she had written us to tell us that she had rejoined her church, refound her faith, got her child exposed to our Lord, and uh, indeed her life had turned so around. It, it really helped degrees. ground that Absolutely. family a little bit uh, and that's in ways they'd lost. One case, but when you're yeah. out uh, in an outreach ministry, one case is enough. Well, hey, everybody. Yeah, right. um, before we go, we've got to mention when this is. Okay, we open uh, December the 11th mm -hmm. at 7.30. We run every night at 7.30. And then on Saturdays, a 2, 4.30, and 7.30. So there's matinees on Saturday, a 4.30 matinee on Sunday, and we close on December the 22nd. Okay. And, and while ticket sales are going well, there are tickets available. Right. Uh, and there's a phone number people can call for information. Yes. Information and tickets, 871-2975. And that number, they could also get information on the Nativity Star. Yes, they could. Mm -hmm. uh, and just in case folks aren't aware of where this particular facility is, why don't you just tell people where it is? Uh, Hennepin at Groveland. It's okay. the big steeple church just as you get off of 94. That's right. That uh, is lit at night and, and is right uh, across from the Guthrie, actually. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. I think we have just a moment, but there's a wonderful story about some of the folks that have portrayed some of the characters. That, I thought there were one or two, but you tell me there have been a number of Mary and Joseph there have uh, been nuptials. There have been three, and uh, Mary and Joseph this year are engaged, as well as about five other marriages of people who have met at the Nativity. So... Again, uh, and certainly this year, if you have some time and would like to just volunteer to help, we have many things we still could use people for. No so doubt. So we are a family. It's a major production. Bob Van Zandt, pleasure to meet you. My pleasure. Thanks well, for thank sharing about so the nativity. Much. It's good. Now, Janet will be back with her next guest. That's Barry Werner. He's the director of operations at Worldwide Pictures, right after this clip from their most recent film, The Ride. Come on, Danny. <laughs> you can do it. All right. I, I wrote it before. You're going to be fine. You can do it, man. <laughs> Come on, Danny. Get on. things. What were you thinking? You could have got yourself killed. Oh, it's you again. Well, now that I got you here by yourself, I'd like to ask you something. How come you ratted me out to the cops? Well, for what? For kicking the soda machine. I didn't tell him anything about that. Well, then, how did I get here? 
I prayed you here. You what? I prayed you'd come here. Well, that was a clip from The Ride, which is being distributed by Worldwide Pictures. And uh, we have today with us from Worldwide Pictures, Barry Werner. Welcome. Hi. Thank Glad you, Glad you Jen. could come. Yeah, thanks for asking. Well, I want to talk about The Ride, but I want to wait to do that. Because okay. I want to talk a little bit about Worldwide Pictures. Well, Tell me about that, um, when it was founded, and mm -hmm. why it was founded. Uh, Worldwide Pictures is the film division, Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Uh, we were founded actually in uh, 1950, but our incorporation papers are 1952. Mm -hmm. We've made uh, probably 125 plus films in our uh, 30 plus years of mm -hmm. ministry, mm -hmm. and always uh, to, in support, direct support of Dr. Billy Graham's ministry. Mm -hmm. Tell me, in 1950 and 1952, what was? Do you know what was going? What the thinking was? Why they wanted to form this company that made feature films that were distributed to theaters? Dr. Graham has always had tremendous vision for uh, sharing the gospel, and he's well aware that there will be a certain number of people that come to the stadium setting to listen to the crusade. Uh, the message from the crusade platform. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, there's every form of communication. There's radio, uh, film, books, magazines. And so over the years, Dr. Graham has uh, one step at a time implemented uh, some ministry that would f uh, focus on that particular aspect mm -hmm. of communication. Mm -hmm. And we're just one of those uh, avenues within the Graham Association film. Mm -hmm. So it's just based on his vision on how to communicate the gospel message to the most number of people possible. Mm -hmm. Now when it was started, when your company was started, mm -hmm. you first started making movies, you were in large theaters and large settings, but that changed. Well actually, uh, it, the first few years, from 1950 to 1964, <clears throat> films were made and released primarily through churches. Then in 1964, we made a movie called The Restless Ones. Mm -hmm. And we released that in theaters across the country and had a tremendous ministry impact. Uh, over 500,000 people uh, actually were asked for counseling material after viewing The Restless Ones. Mm -hmm. That started from 1964 to 1988, a chain of uh, nine feature films that were released in theaters across the country. Mm -hmm. In 1988, uh, we, we really chose to stop. It was a choice on the part of the association based around the fact that uh, f for many years there was huge theaters out there, 1,100 seats, 900 seats, and we rented those theaters on what they called a four-wall basis, where we actually had our own booker at Worldwide Pictures that made a telephone call, rented the theater. Mm -hmm. uh, the multiplex uh, cinemas sort of started showing up, and year by year more and more theaters became multiplexed. And they would break those big houses down into two or three theaters, but the rent didn't change. So economically, it just became prohibitive for us to try and release a film with one-third the seats and the same total cost. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So we just had to stop until we could come up with another method of distribution. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1988. In 1988, uh, we actually distributed, uh, the last film was Caught, mm -hmm. C-A-U-G-H-T. Which I have, yep. I have here. Oh, thank you. This <coughs> is uh, caught, and actually I got a chance to watch a little bit of this film, um, along with uh, some of these others that you gave to me here. Really quite a, a, a number of, of releases and films um, that, you've, that you've made through the company. Um, tell me, so you gave up on, the, on doing this through the, through the major, or in the, in the theaters, right. and, but now you're back. <coughs> Well, we actually never stopped making films. Right. We just went back to our original distribution mm -hmm. plan was uh, back in uh, through distribution through the churches. Right. Normally we would do about oh, anywhere from 900 to 1400 screens when we went out in the theaters. Right. Uh, with churches we could do about 20 to 25,000 showings. We had pretty much the same uh, number of people that viewed the films but a different clientele. Mm -hmm. uh, our intent has always been to go to the um, most commercial venue where you have the greatest cross-section of people mm -hmm. and even though we have probably 80 percent plus in uh, North America that uh, say they're affiliated with the Christian faith in one way or another uh, the majority of people that are watching in churches are very active in the church our goal was really to reach the masses with the mm -hmm. message mm -hmm. now, the theaters much uh, fits that much better mm -hmm. and with the ride, now you are back. We are back. And you are <coughs> going to, you've, um, you tested this. Exactly. In Los Angeles. How did it test? 
Well, we actually did a, it's a, a phase project. We actually did a focus groups in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. It tested very well. The, um, they just uh, drew a random crowd. They handed out tickets in uh, lines at the theater. Mm -hmm. They handed out tickets to this uh, private screening. We did a screening at the Warner Brothers studio. Mm -hmm. So they handed out tickets in malls and they went to businesses. So just a huge cross section of people showed up to watch the film. Tested very well. Mm -hmm. uh, industry standards say that they need somewhere around 70% of the people that view a screening like this to uh, recommend it, that they would recommend it highly or they would uh, you know, give it high points mm -hmm. in, in those questions. This, this film did better than that mm -hmm. and it was up uh, between 70 and 80%, which is very good for a niche kind of a film. What did people like about it? Well, they, you know, the most common comment was we love the fact that it had no nudity, no swearing, no, um, there are a couple fist fights, but there's no graphic violence like mm -hmm. murders and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. they, they just said we love the moral tone, we love the story. They, the, the comment that was made over and over is a heartwarming story. It made him laugh and mm -hmm. uh, made him cry. You know, I've watched it a number of times and it still affects me emotionally the same mm -hmm. way. It's just a, it's a really good story. What is the story? Can you do a quick synopsis? Well, I can. It? It's an old rodeo legend, a cowboy right at the end of his career. He's um, uh, starting to get into some lifestyle problems based on the fact he's no longer number one in the circuit and he's starting to drink and carouse just a bit. Uh, he winds up stealing a truck from a boy's ranch, and the judge sentenced him to 90 days on the boy's ranch mm -hmm. uh, as community service mm -hmm. for that theft. He, uh, <clears throat> he was a bull riding specialist, and his job specifically on the ranch was to teach a boy how to ride a bull. It's really cute stories of all the, some of the pranks that these young boys pull <laughs> on this old cowboy, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the real story is the relationship between the man and the boy. Mm -hmm. And uh, what he doesn't know is the boy has a, uh, an illness that's possibly terminal, and he falls in love with the boy. Mm -hmm. uh, then based on that, um, he never realizes it's going to be jerked from his hands or mm -hmm. could be jerked from his hands mm -hmm. with this terminal illness. Mm -hmm. Just, um, that's a really the heartwarming part of the story. When mm -hmm. he comes to realize he loves someone so much, he would give his own life if he could mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. spare this boy. Mm -hmm. The metaphor of that, of course, is the fact that Christ loved us so much that mm -hmm. he did give his own life to spare us from that. Mm -hmm. um, eternal judgment side of things. We have another clip from the film. I Great. think that's a good uh, lead into okay. this second clip. Let's roll the film. Good, thanks. Well, if we're going to do this at all, we're going to do it right. We'll start with the fundamentals. Now, we ain't got much to work with, so we'll have to make do with what we got. I want you to imagine this is 1,800 pounds of real angry flesh under your butt. 100% USDA prime mean. Now, the key is believing you're in control at all times. What's the matter? What do you mean, what we got? Well, believing that this barrel is a bull, stuff like that. It's the way all bull riders start out, son. Right. Well, unless you can pull something out of your hat, this is a bull. Hey, I got an idea. Let's pray for one. Dear God, please give this brat a bull. Hey, Mr. Banks, Danny, come on. Mike wants you guys out front right away. Thanks, Smokey. How long ago did you arrange for that? Just showed up. Why? No reason. And there was another scene from the ride. Now, you are going to be showing this entire film in Minneapolis in December. We will. Tell we'll us where and uh, when. <clears throat> 13 theaters across the metro area. Uh, all of the first run theaters, uh, Mall of America, Willow Creek, uh, I can't name them all, yeah. but yeah. Uh, so we'll be in, in December 5th through the 12th, mm -hmm. and if it, it may hold over, it may not, but mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a great story. I'd recommend you see it, Janet. Well, I will try, <laughs> okay. I will try and get a chance to do that. Well, that's about as weak a that's promise true. as I can it's, accept. So that's pretty that's sad, isn't it? <laughs> it Tell is. me, though, but you're <laughs> testing not only in Minneapolis, you have uh, nine other cities? Right. Our strategy really is after the focus groups, and we went to a test, and we'll be in um, uh, Portland and Boise and Fresno and Albuquerque, mm -hmm. Waco, San Antonio, mm -hmm. Grand Rapids, Michigan, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Did you choose those cities for a particular reason? Uh, well, we did. Some of the northern cities for the specific reason we wanted to see how rodeo would play in the north. Mm -hmm. And uh, like Portland uh, as well as a sort of a 
half cowboy town. Yeah. But the others are a little more, <laughs> little more western sure, feel sure, to it. Sure. Sure. And so what do you hope to accomplish with this film? What, when, when all mm -hmm. is said and done, you've tested it in these nine markets and through the Twin yeah. Cities. What's the, what's the plan? Well, the gospel message is very clear in the film. So uh, of course, our initial uh, intent would be to uh, show that gospel message and just as a fabric of life and everyday life out there. Mm -hmm. The the goal would be uh, during the test would be to see if we can really generate a crowd. If people like the film, if they're interested in, uh, and we can build the attendance, and if it'll pay for itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so the whole idea is testing uh, the distribution system. We know that the message is clear because that's in the film. Yep. But now it's the distribution system. And can we do it again? If mm -hmm. it works once, can we work with the industry, walk our way through this exactly like any other independent film would? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, then we would like to uh, look down the road. And long term, our board will make the decision. But long term, we'd like to see if there's a possibility of doing this over and over again. Mm -hmm. Now, this spring, earlier this spring, there was some, some initial production or work being done on a, another film for Worldwide right. Pictures here right. in Minneapolis, right. which is really was my first introduction to the fact that you were even here, which is really another kind of... I know. I'm going to hold that against you. Yeah, you sh well, you should. <laughs> um, <laughs> but tell us um, about that and, and maybe the possibility. Are you going to be looking at Minneapolis for as another potential place to be making our independent films? Yeah, we've talked to the uh, people from the film board here. Mm -hmm. We really like the climate. We like Minneapolis. And all the through the years, we've not made a film here in the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. Part of that is uh, climate. Part of it is industry. Um, but we have a real strong film industry here. We'd like to utilize that uh, bit of the local side. Mm -hmm. And actually, we probably would have followed through with this film, except it was fall and it was a fishing story. Right. And so we bumped up against some real uh, climatic issues. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. we had to step away from it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, chances are very good. It's still on the drawing board for next spring. We'll just have to see when we come back in the spring if there's a way that we can work that sure. in. But our intent is that over some period of time, we do want to work locally. That would be great. And, uh, it'll just be one project. We hope we do two mm -hmm. or three a year. Mm -hmm. We'd sure like to do one here. Tremendous. Mm -hmm. That's very good, good. to hear. Yeah. We have a phone number, too, that I want to make sure that we get to people if they want to know more about the screenings this December. Great. Okay. And that is, you get to tell it. Oh, thank you very much. Well. <laughs> it's 800-378-5345. You got it right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my uh, distribution people will love me for that. Otherwise, very, I'll very be good. lynched when I get back. Yeah. Well, it's really been a pleasure to meet you, Barry. appreciate your coming here today. Thanks, Jane. And hope that you have some very uh, uh, successful run with your film in December. Thanks. And if you go and see it, it'll help. That's true. Good. Thank you very and, much. And uh, good luck with uh, hopefully doing some production maybe here this spring. If we do, we'll let you know. I would be Wouldn't happy that be to nice to do a little segment on set? Absolutely. Great. Love to do it. Okay. Thanks again. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Phil will be back to wrap up the show with me right after this TV fact. Well, hope you like the show. I hope so, too. Good guests. Mm -hmm. Now, lest you think that the only thing we cover in this kind of topic yeah. are Christian-oriented themes, you know, historically, we have looked at things like the architecture of Jewish religion mm -hmm. and even indigenous connections to spirituality mm -hmm. and the arts and stuff like that. So Absolutely. it just happened that that's what we talked about this time. That is true. So, good. Um, you know, we like to do a little newsy chat yep. here at this point in the show. Thought we might mention there's a great looking show, an exhibition over at the Wiseman Art Museum over at the University of Minnesota. It's called Indian Humor. Hmm. And uh, it's humor among Native Americans uh, of all different tribes. Uh, and they talk about, oh, historical events, the trickster, uh, people playing Indian, uh, humor in domestic situations, and just contemporary life in, uh, in general from an Indian point of view. It's all mm -hmm. Indian artists. And that'll be running, I think, until very early January. So this sounds like a nice show and always a good mm -hmm. place to go and see uh, mm -hmm. an exhibition. One of the many things that people can do during this holiday season, if you have a little time off, Get out and see some of the stuff that's happening. There's so much great music and theater oh, yeah. and stuff going on during Every the holidays. Every discipline, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got news about something that's yes, coming to town? We have a movie that's going to be shooting in the Twin Cities area. It's called The Simple Plan. It is directed by Sam Raimi. They plan to start shooting on or about January 5th. So we're very oh, excited wow. to have another movie in town. Back in town, the season begins. Yeah, Billy Bob Thornton. Oh, cool. Be here. Yeah. Cool. And speaking fun. of blockbusters and big yes. money and stuff, 
A lot of you probably remember that the Lion King was here in town, uh, opened, it premiered here in Minneapolis last summer, uh, and it's just doing incredible box office out in uh, New York. Mm -hmm. I mean, huge. They're, they're redefining Broadway is how huge. they're putting it. Huge. Huge, yeah. uh, if, if we may emphasize that. <laughs> um, just some facts about what it meant here in Minneapolis. Uh, the Lion King generated more than $10 million in direct and indirect revenues to the city of Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. um, and of that total, 1.1 million was in wages and benefits to local people working in the industry. So that was a good thing to have here in town. It was so. a very good thing to have here, indeed. Um, also, speaking of blockbusters, yeah. the Blockbuster McKnight Film Fund Award winners will be announced on December 3rd at the Walker. Oh, very exciting. Yes. Yeah. So watch for that. If you missed the event, look and see who got the, the award. That's a great um, uh, development fund for filmmakers. Right. And if you've seen anybody or heard anything on the show that you want to know more about, any of the guests or the uh, projects that are involved in, call the City Cable 34 hotline, 673-2234. Mm -hmm. And that number also is the number to call if you want that wonderful uh, opportunity <laughs> here for the uh, park board calendar. Mm -hmm. It's nifty. Mm -hmm. Really recommend it. So. so we really appreciate your watching our show Artifacts in December. And coming up is our calendar, yes, as usual. But at the end of the show in December, we always put up a list of all the guests who've been mm -hmm. on the show for the entire year. So get your pads and paper and pencils ready and uh, note these people. Write down. down the events and make note of all these wonderful people who have given their time and expertise That's right. to ne us. Next month, Pat Young will be on the show to talk about the 26th Street artists. Until then, I'm Phil Lindsay. And I'm Janet Zahn. Thanks for watching.